It's the Grand Circle Podcast with your host, Samuel Galubak and Inessa Strelnikova. It's your intimate look into the lives of world champion dancers. And now, here's Samuel and Inessa. Welcome back, everyone, to the Grand Circle Podcast with me, Inessa Strelnikova. And my co host, Samuel Galubak. Today's episode is sponsored by the Holiday Dance Classic Championship, which is taking place on December 11th through 15th in Las Vegas at the beautiful Luxor Hotel. Well, and we also have a very special guest today in the studio with us. She's a choreographer of many different shows. She's a coach and international judge. She's also one of the highest ranked New Zealand ballroom dancer. We have here in the studio with us the one and only Wendy Johnson. Welcome, Wendy. Welcome. Well, hi, guys. It's nice to be here. Wendy, so um, since we mentioned that you're a famous choreographer, can you name a few uh, places, uh, countries where you have been doing this kind of work? Well, I've been doing shows for a lot of years and actually in Canada, too, I think about 20 years for Can-Am up here in Canada. I've done shows now in Israel, which I had a really great time doing. And that show, The Wow Show, is currently running, uh, not the one I choreographed, but The Wow Show is running at the Rio Hotel in Las Vegas. Um, I do shows all over America, and I've done choreography for Dancing with the Stars in America. That's fantastic. Can you tell us more about your experience choreographing uh, in Dancing with the Stars? Well, Dancing with the Stars, I came in about season um, two or three, I think. I forget. It was when Drew Lachey won. And um, I helped Cheryl Burke choreograph uh, his show, most of his show stuff that he did during the show. Um, and then because the producers got to know me, they brought me in to do some of the big professional numbers. So I did seven of the professional numbers over the next six series, seven series. And I choreographed for Emmett, Emmett Smith and Christian Lafonte, Rob Kardashian, Jack Osborne, just to name a few of the people. How was it working with those kind of stars? Well, it was great fun. You know, I mean, I, I loved Emmett Smith because Emmett was a football player and what I realized with Emmett was he you could tell him something and he would change immediately because they do that evidently in football so if I'd say to him no that's not working I need you to be I dealt more in picture stories about what I needed him to be and he would just switch it and do it he was great I loved working with Emmett and I just recently saw him at Cheryl Cheryl's wedding and uh He's like, come on, come and have a dance with me. And I swear it was one of the best dances I ever had. He was great fun to dance with. Is there anybody else that uh, left an impression? Well, you know, Christian De La Fuente, he was a guy who, he made it to the semifinals and he um, snapped a, a ligament in his arm, uh, his left arm. So he had a choice then whether to go through to the final or not. And I said, hey, I can do choreography off your right arm, so let's do it. So we choreographed a uh, uh, salsa or mambo off his right arm and he went into that final. And uh, he said, he'd said to all of us, quite a few of us, the people in the dress department, makeup, hair, different people, if I make the final, I'll take you all to Chile because he was a very famous movie star in um, Chile. He made that final and he took us all to Chile. We spent a week in wow. Chile. He paid the airfares, he put us up in the uh, fabulous hotel and took us all around Chile because he knew a lot of people. When we got out at the airport in Chile, there was, he was like a rock star. So, and we were in the paper as the friends of uh, Christian De La Fuente. It was a very nice experience um, to work with him and then to, for him to do that back for us. It was really great. You mentioned you, chore you made it... You choreographed that dance to his right hand. Yeah, I choreographed so that he could lead from his right hand but not really use his left hand because he'd lost the use of his left hand. I think that takes a lot of creativity to change a whole dance to just, just to use to one, yeah. just to use one, one hand, hand, right? And he did it, and he did a great, uh, he did a great finale. Yeah, he, I don't even think he was last in the final. I think he did really good. <laughs> And he was very happy with it, with the result, obviously. Oh, that, that yeah. First of all, to have made the final and then the challenge of actually competing with a, um, a, a damaged arm was huge. And he kept his word. He took us all to Chile. I have a lot of respect and uh, fond memories of that time. Do you speak with any of the people that you work with at Dancing with the Stars to this day? Well, funnily enough, at Cheryl's wedding, Cheryl married Matthew Lawrence just recently, and I went to the wedding, and all the producers from Dancing with the Stars were at that 
uh, wedding. They, One of them's on World of Dance, another one's on So You Think You Can Dance. So they're all scattered around now doing other shows besides Dancing with the Stars. And we were all laughing about the old days when we, when the show first came out here. It was from England. It was Strictly Come Dancing. They never thought it would work in America. It did the for most, many... Yeah, the most surprised people were the producers. And it worked for a lot yeah. of seasons. Yeah, yes. it worked for a lot of seasons. And it's now it's still everywhere. Going. Yeah, it's all around the world. So around the world. How long does it take to uh, make uh, choreography, for example, for Dancing with the Stars? Or does it depend on every particular dancer and their ability? Well, you know, what I do is mostly in my life, I do do a lot of things, but I'm mostly known for show stuff. And um, like today, I'd be choreographing six lessons in a row of choreography. So you, I'm pretty good at um, doing choreography for the person in front of me. I evaluate what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and then I'll play on their strengths and probably try to avoid their weaknesses. So I'm pretty good at being able to do that. And very, if the, if I like the music, I'm great. If I don't like the music, I'm like dead as a duck. I'm that's, very influenced by music. That's amazing how like you can take six different couples and do six different pieces of choreography. Pieces of choreography, and not to mix them up or anything. It's and sometimes I remember them <laughs> better than the teachers do in the studio. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But um, I'm wondering, like, so you, you basically look at the person and you decide right on the spot. So it's pretty spontaneous thing. You well, improvise, usually, right? usually I ask somebody to dance, even though uh, I may know the person and they go, oh, I want a new Viennese waltz or I want a new tango. I'll go, okay, show me what you've been doing. So always I get them to show me what they're doing because my head is actually empty. Uh, and then I see what they're doing and I think, oh, well, that's worth saving. I like that bit. I'll add something to it. And then once I get started, it just goes and goes. But I'll tell you a funny story. They, I, I think you do know that I started in ballet originally. And um, one of the ballet competitions that we used to do was called Impromptu. So you would hear the music once and then you would go on stage and dance to the music. Wow. So everyone was the same. While you were dancing, somebody else was standing on the side of the stage listening to the music, and then they would go out and dance. I always won that competition. And it wasn't until years later, maybe 25 years, 30 years later, I was choreographing in a ballroom, and I went, I was just listening to the music dancing around, and I thought, that's what I did when I was a little kid. I just didn't know that I knew how to choreograph. You just yeah. listen to a song and you dance. And right? I dance, yeah. That's definitely your forte. It is. And because it, it's, it's not because I'm clever or anything, it's just not hard. It's just yours. It's yeah. your ability. It's in the blood. Yes. Yeah. So, well, since we're talking about ballet and you started ballet when you were in young ages and uh, was it back in, because, uh, well, did we mention that you are from New mentioned. Zealand? Yeah, I'm from New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, I started dancing. Um, Funny how I started dancing. My father used to have a barber shop and he used to cut the hair of a little boy, maybe five or six years old. And his mother was a ballet teacher and she would see me dancing around the barber shop. And she said to my parents, you know, one day you need to get her taught dancing. And my parents were not interested in dancing and they were like, oh, whatever, you know. And then when I was about nine, I was very small and very um, sort of muscly and not soft around like the other little girls and they were like well maybe if we put her to ballet she'll become more like soft and round like little girls you know little did they know that my physique actually was much better trained to be an athlete or a dancer you know I just didn't look the same as everyone else and I was quite small so they put they remembered that dance teacher so they put me to ballet quite late really about nine and um, I did really well in ballet. I won everything I could win in New Zealand. Now, it was at the point where did I go to the New Zealand Ballet Company or go to the Borovansky, which was the Australian Ballet Company at the time. But I was only about 16, and that was quite young to um, make a choice like that. Anyway, my mom, about 17, decided to send me to... Um, Borum dance class because in the studio ballet was in the back studio and Borum was in the front studio, so I didn't. I was a little ballerina. I did not want to go to learn this Borum dancing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so off I go, <laughs> and then I discover how easy it is compared to ballet. And some of the more advanced dancers in that class took me and go, "Oh well, they'd teach me a cha cha and they teach me this and that," and they go, "You know what we can do? 
a competition with you where it was more advanced, te- uh, not a teacher really, more advanced amateur with a beginner. And I won everything. It was easy. for Compared to ballet, for me, it was really easy. Do you think your experience in ballet helped you progress faster in ballroom and Latin? Oh, sure. Any kind of dance training is going to help you with other dance training. You, first of all, know the discipline. Um, and you know music. And, of course, you have to learn different techniques. And... Um, I mean, I think in two or three years, I was a champion in my country in Borum and Latin. But it, I, it, again, it was not that hard. It's never been that hard for me to dance. Now, balance my bank account, forget it. <laughs> but dance, it's okay. You know, so Your it bank just shows account dances you. around, right? Yeah, it's just, you know, it, you, it's not a clever thing. It's just something I think you are born with, you know. And for, so I've danced all my life. You know, I wanted to be a florist, and my mother said, there's no money in flowers. You have to work in a bank, which was stupid since I can't balance my bank account. <laughs> and, um, and then eventually, uh, I went to England for better training and uh, worked in an office. And I used to have great dresses that my mother made. And then to go to England, the dresses were too expensive, so I had to learn how to make them myself. Well, every dress I wore, I would sell immediately that I wore it. So then I had about six people wanting dresses, and I was like, well, that's enough to start making dresses. So I made costumes in England to support myself. And Borum? Borum, and Borum in Latin. And Borum. then I um, stopped working in an office. And to tell you the truth, I've never worked for anyone pretty much since then with awesome. whatever I've done, you know. So you were sixth at British Open in 1973 with Philip Nicholas. No, not with Philip Nicholas. Uh, well, yes, with Philip Nicholas and his partner. And I had a first husband. Right. Anyway. Tell us more. because <laughs> we, we I think our listeners want to hear this. Yeah. So between us as two couples, we were, for years, we thought we were seventh at the British. You know, one mark off the final, both of us. And we used to joke and say we should have danced with each other, right? And it wasn't until like maybe a year ago in Australian history, dance history, we discovered that we actually tied for sixth at the British. And in 1973, they had a five-couple final. So I, I came sixth at the British, but didn't have to do the final. So name so. the partner uh, of the sixth place at the British Open so we can, listeners can understand that way. So I was, at, at those days, it was Peter and Wendy Smith. I was Wendy Smith then. And then uh, Philip was Philip and uh, Jan Nicholas were the other couple. And Philip and I have been friends since then. And we still go to Blackpool together. That's so. amazing. So you were sixth, but seventh. Well, we thought we were seventh, yeah, <laughs> until we read it in yeah. Australian dance history, yeah. Who was your first dance partner in ballroom? Well, my first dance partner, it, he, does, he never danced very long. Uh, and then I started uh, dating this guy, and then I married him. <laughs> and I went to England with him. But in the end, it was, uh, it, we split up. Mm-hmm. How many dance partners have you had throughout your career? Well, I had my one I started with, my first one, and then two. I married both of them. I'm not marrying any more dance partners. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bad idea to marry your dance partner or a good idea? Or well, it depends. I think, you know, it's like anything. If you, But I think there are a lot of dance couples that get married that probably shouldn't have been married. Do you, you think know? having a relationship in a couple, like dancing, is better? Or? Well... <clears throat> From your own experience? Well, from my own experience, was uh, they both were pretty miserable partnerships from the point of that point of view of that. Um, you know, it's like my son right now. He danced with his wife, and he said he preferred to be married, and he they chose not to dance together. For him, he thought it was better not to. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. That's right. Well, um, so since we're talking about uh, being in England and the British Open, how many countries have you been uh, around working, choreographing, competing maybe? Well, if you count judging, probably something like about 20. 20 20 different countries. That's amazing. That's Mm. a lot. But you primarily right now, uh, you're residing in the U.S. Well, I reside now in New York. Most of my life in uh, America was spent in California. I lived 10 years in uh, north of San Francisco, 10 years in Santa Barbara, and 20 years in San Diego. And then my daughter had grandkids. So I sold everything up and uh, moved to New York to be a grandmother. 
And I have two grandkids in New York. There's six and a half and two and a half. And then two weeks ago, my son and his wife in San Diego had a baby daughter. Congratulations. Congratulations. Right. So now I have a granddaughter in San Diego, and now I don't know what I'm going to do. So now you're flying in between New York, probably California, yes. New York, California. Right. Well, uh, are you an American now? No, I am. I have uh, always been, um, had an alien card in America. I'm a New Zealander. A New Zealand passport is an excellent passport. And sometimes I go through immigration and they go, well, why haven't you become a citizen? And to tell you the truth, I never think about it until I go through immigration. <laughs> and um, I don't know, my heart was always, I'm always a New Zealander. America has been very good to me. And most of my, I've lived there longer than I ever lived in New Zealand, but I something about I'm always going to be a New Zealander or a Kiwi. Kiwi. Um, Kiwi. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about Kiwi. So uh, uh, isn't that the same name of the competition that you own in or organize in uh, New Zealand? Yes, Kiwi I Classic. Have a, uh, yeah, I have a competition in New Zealand called the Kiwi Dance Classic. And I started it because there was no pro-am dancing in New Zealand. And uh, a friend of mine out there said, well, you know what, let's run a competition. And I said, well, I'm not running a competition in a hall. They run them in halls and what I consider not good venues. And I said, it's going to be in a hotel. It has to be done right. It has to be done like an American or a Canadian competition. So I said, if you're willing to risk that, let's do it. So we started a one-day competition, and it had enough entries for us to make it a two-day competition. We get uh, competitors from Australia, some from America, and all over New Zealand. And now pro-am dancing is alive and kicking in New Zealand. That's amazing. That's amazing. So that's, that's a true contribution into uh, pro-am uh, dancing part of, of our industry. Can you name the dates for a Kiwi Classic? Yeah, the Kiwi Classic next year is the 11th and 12th of April. And um, the thing I found in New Zealand, which had distressed me somewhat, was that when I lived there, there were uh, like a, there was a final in the professional events, a semi-final in the... Uh, amateur top events at semi-final and final and now they can hardly raise a final and then hardly any professionals out there so I thought you know that's successfully killed dancing in the last 40 years over there <laughs> but the thing that makes dancing go the world go round is particularly in America and now it's happening in Russia and Italy and all over the world was pro-am dancing which I saw when I came to America it's also big in Canada which allowed people to stay in the dance business instead of them having a day job in an office and then just dancing for fun at night yeah. they could actually stay in the industry and I said to the people out there I said for some reason they asked me to have a meeting with everybody and I which I did with the professionals and they were asking about my life in America and um, the old pro-am won't work out here so I said to them who's here has got a, a, a student who would like to dance with them in a competition and they all put their hand up and I got up to something like 10 students that wanted to dance with them in a competition. And they said, oh, well, that's just a novelty thing. I go, no, that's not a novelty thing. It's, it's business. And I said, so you guys discriminate out here. If you have a partner, you can go in a dance competition. But if you don't, you can't. And they all looked at me and they went, well, it's not really discrimination. I said, mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. And if you guys should give your students the opportunity to dance if they want. Okay. So first of all, they did, but they wouldn't charge their students. So then I was like, okay, so when you go to your lawyer, he gives it to you for free. And they were like, well, no. And I go, well, why are you giving your knowledge away for free? And so in the end, they finally started to charge for their time which was how it should be and then they would only dance like twice and I go listen if you put the hair and makeup on a dress on they're going to dance more than twice and sure enough of course they danced more I said you guys if they want to buy a Rolls Royce you're going to go and sell them a Honda and they go well and I go yes you are because you're making the choice for them you're not really giving them the opportunity to make a choice for themselves I want to just go back to the name of kiwi classic kiwi. where does the word kiwi come from because i don't think our listeners know what know, kiwi know is. the history of the word kiwi in new zealand well, first of all i'm a, anyone from new zealand is called a kiwi because our native bird is a kiwi bird which is a flightless bird and some of you might have seen it on the kiwi um <coughs> excuse me shoe polish it's a little bird that's only in new zealand only comes out at night and very rarely do you see it 
So everyone thinks it's because of the kiwi fruit, but the kiwi fruit actually was called a Chinese gooseberry. And when they uh, found they had a market in America, particularly in America or, or, or over the world, they had Chinese gooseberry didn't sound like a good name. Mm -hmm. So they named the fruit kiwi fruit. So all of you who eat kiwi fruit today, when I was a kid, it was called a Chinese gooseberry. That's interesting. That, yeah. That's interesting. And I'm glad Sam, you asked this kind of question. Can I go back, Wendy, and um, uh, talk about you choreographing coaching? Um, so we, we understand you coach champions. You coach people from shows such as Dancing with the Stars. You choreograph uh, for competitions. I've seen your work in, in Canada and in the U.S. And uh, it's very impressive. You're a very inspirational uh, choreographer. Now, um, the question uh, is, do you actually work with beginners at all? And if you do, do you find joy in teaching someone who is just started like maybe not a long time ago? Um, well, you know, if you bring me a beginner and you ask me to choreograph a little routine for them, for sure I would choreograph it within the limits of what they're capable of doing. Uh, it's a funny question that you would ask this because I always, when I first came to this country, I learned a first lesson. And the first lesson was how a box step worked in five dances, how uh, swing was two triple steps and a rock step, how cha-cha was a rock step and a triple step, a rock step and a triple step. So I actually like teaching that very first beginner lesson and showing somebody that they can do five dances in half an hour. And how just they are the related ba yeah, through the basic one elements. Yeah. Well, because everything but, works on the basis. Right? right. I do like that lesson because I like seeing the excitement of the people to find out that they actually can dance. They can move to the music. It's the middle ground teaching that uh, I find less interesting because I'm not, I've never been a coach that you have a lesson off me every week. I like to come in and choreograph routines or come in and have a look at your dancing overall yeah, overall, and say, well, this is what I see and then come back later and go see where you're going with it. But I've never been a person to have the same person have a lesson off me every single week. I, I, I think some people like doing that. It's not my thing. When you coach, how truthful are you to the couple? I'm pretty truthful. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say to you, you'll never dance, you know, because everyone can dance to some degree. Right. But I, uh, I, I'm pretty har harsh, I, I guess, as a coach, because I feel, I'll tell you why I'm like this. When I was in England, I had lessons of people who worked on my feather three-step for three years. It was bad when I went there. It was bad while I was there, and it's probably bad today. But what I realized was my feather three-step in Foxtrot was only one dance of 10 that I was doing every week at a competition. And I was like, nobody coached me for what I was actually doing. So when I became a coach, I was like, I'm going to give you as much information in the shortest possible time I can so that you can think. If I, th if I think that I've taught you to think about what you're doing and go away and try something, I feel like I've accomplished something. So I'll never keep you like on one step forever. So you always look at the big picture. I look the at the big picture with everything I do. Even if I did a show, it's like I splash it, like a, a painting. I splash the paint on and then I take a look at it and then I go back and refine it. I've never inched along with choreography. I get it done fairly quickly, then go back and go, oh, well, that works or that doesn't work or I can fix that. And uh, I'm sort of like that in life, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Well, uh, so we, we see that you do enjoy this kind of process, but do you enjoy judging? Because we see you judging all, all, all over the um, United States and Canada and uh, outside of uh, North America. Well, you know, I do quite enjoy judging. Sometimes judging is easy and sometimes judging is not. Sometimes I come off a competition and I'm like, oh, you know, it was. I didn't feel like I had enough time. I'm not sure I did as good as I could do, but I do go out every single, even with Pro-Am, from the beginners to the end, uh, and judge everything that's put in front of me. I, uh, I have a philosophy about judges, which I'll share with you. And um, what I want, I want in a judge is I want a judge to uh, have an opinion and not be afraid to put that result down. I think there are a lot of judges who are nervous to mark what they really want. I think there are a lot of judges, um, some of them don't know what they want. And there's some judges have somebody else's opinion. And I, I'm like, you know what, you need to have the courage of your conviction and 
to your best of your ability, have an opinion about it and not be afraid to, to do it. And I think I judge because uh, I feel that a person dancing on the floor is owed that respect from a judge. I think when you just define the criteria of a good judge, yeah. <laughs> a genuine one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's sincere. that's what you should, a sincere judge, that's what you should aspire to. I don't care if you have coaching off me or don't have coaching off me. It's not, in fact, sometimes I just want somebody to have a lesson off me just to tell them, okay, just so you know what it is I like. I personally like you, it's not about that. But this is what I like in dancing. And then I would say to them, you never have to come back to me again. But I feel, thank you for your respect to actually ask me. And now you know where I stand, you know? Wonderful. I, I had a question when you about the judging. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people, I think, are listeners to, when they look at the professional, let's say, Latin final or standard final, they have thoughts in their head. How do these judges pick first, second, third, fourth, fifth? looking at those kind of dancers how do you mark them well this is a really good question so when this is and this is personally what i do when i first of all first impressions are important when you walk on that floor if you're all unknown say i don't know anybody who's in that competition they walk out clearly somebody who's really put together and well groomed i'm going to be attracted to that because automatically the brain assumes they know what's going on. You do the same if you see a judge goes out and she looks beautiful or the man looks immaculate in a tuxedo and somebody looks a little sloppy out there. You always think the one who looks immaculate must be the best judge. They may not be, but you thought that. So when we're watching a competition and people come out, that's the first impression we get. I usually scan a floor and I decide it, it's it, once you've done like a first round, a semi final, a final, we've kind of got an idea in our head of what we liked or what we didn't. And then you end up with a final. Very often in a final, three I had in there and three I didn't. This makes your life a little um, challenging out there. Sometimes six people are out there and I like all of them. They're all about the same, but somebody has to be first and somebody has to be six. The one who came first thinks I love him and the one who came six thinks I hate him. I might have hated all of you or I might have loved all of you, but I had to make a decision. I'm very much about music and emotion. I, I, technique is important, but I, I think you see great technique and you see terrible technique. So the bar's not that high. Keep it at least average and we're not going to notice your feet so much as other things. For you as a judge, what do you look at most? Do you look at appearance or do you look at technique, as you said? What, what do you zoom in on? Like while looking at dancers? No, I don't zoom in on technique. I definitely am a person who, if you have an extraordinary feet, like a ballerina or something, I notice it, you know. If you have sloppy feet, I'm going to notice it. But if your feet are okay, I, that's not what I'm going to see, the first thing. The first thing I'm going to see is, it's like anything. What draws you to something? Maybe someone's having a great time out there in cha-cha. Immediately, they, I'm looking at them because they're having a great time and it's musical and I'm enjoying it. You know, if somebody looks like it's an exercise and kind of bored, then I'm kind of bored watching them. If somebody's trying too hard, and it, for me it comes into overdancing. So it's like, what's a great actress? You know, the great actress is a person like Meryl Streep who can be whatever she wants to be when she does that role. There are other actresses who just play themselves. Doesn't matter what movie they're in, they look the same. They play themselves. So this is to all our dancer listeners. You're getting a tip from the from a world class judge telling you that appearance is a number one thing. Well, appearance is important because you look at the person who looks good. That simply means that they put more time into their appearance. They groom themselves. They invested more time and money, possibly into uh, a better costume, into a nicer hair, and that costs money if you can if you don't know how to do it yourself, right? Uh, into makeup so definitely you want to give credit to someone who already invested and got more prepared than somebody that looks less yeah groomed, i right? mean that's just human nature yes you, you you the audience if you lined up all the judges they'll pick the ones who look the best they think they're the best judges but it's it, not the winning criteria correct yeah uh, it's not it, it's it's like, no, that doesn't get you to win. That just made me look at you when you came yes. out on the floor. And but now but you it need still to do catches your eye on it? It catches your eye. Yeah. Yeah. So still have your technique good. but You've got to have everything eye. ultimately. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, but what an, I don't know. What Anessa likes might not be the same as I like. Well, every judge is different. Right. That's why we have a bunch no, of judges. No, for me, it's the same thing. I, yeah. I gotta see if I see couple look like a million dollar. Definitely, your eyes are attracted to this couple, and then. Uh, but it's not my interview today. So. No, but you know what? <laughs> I it's it's a good subject because I remember judging somewhere, and I walked in, and sometimes when you walk into the ballroom, and Anessa will tell you this too, particularly in pro am, you go in and the floor is loaded with people. You don't know anyone's number. And so you're looking around the floor and I saw this woman who was so dressed, beautifully dressed, right? And I marked her well in that first dance. So it was, say it was five dances in a row. By the time I got to the third dance, I was like, and there was a, a woman who looked like she had some kind of house dress on, hadn't bothered to do her hair, kind of dirty shoes. And uh, she was last. And then when I got to like dance number three, I was like, oh my God, the one who's all dressed nice actually isn't that good. And the one who looked pretty scruffy is actually a really good dancer. And by the time I got to the last dance, I had totally flipped it. Yes. This just backs up the quote that don't judge a book by its cover. That's exactly right. <laughs> but you know, when we get one minute, uh, 15 or one and a half minutes to judge something, that first impression is really, uh, it's really strong. It I is. mean... It, it truly is. I hate to say that. It draws your attention, yeah. for sure. But then they have to prove themselves. Oh, right? yeah. the well, they do have to prove themselves. That's oh, why yeah. by dance number three and four, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I've made a mistake here. Yeah. yeah. But you can fix a mistake, you know. And the moral of that story is, and it's not really always to do with money, because I remember Terry Leone, who was a great friend of mine, said, it doesn't have to be expensive to be chic. You can put together a black dress with some jewelry, put your hair done, nice shoes, and go out on the floor and look a million dollars. It's not that it had to have 3,000 rhinestones on, or it's about, it, it's about he, like, what he said was true. It doesn't have to be expensive to be chic. So, but the other lady wasn't chic. She looked a mess. <laughs> Yes. Well, uh, Wendy, now that we know you live in New York and you've lived in L.A., so uh, between the two cities, uh, which one is closer to your heart or do you like them both equally? Well, actually, I never lived in L.A. I lived in San Diego. San Diego. I'm oh, yeah. Yeah. But um, it's funny you would ask that because I've just been out in San Diego because my last granddaughter was born two weeks ago and the weather was perfect and the sky was blue and... Then I came and it's clean and it's lovely. And then I, you know, San Diego is right on the water. Yes. Beautiful little town. Beautiful. Then I came back to New York and I happened the taxi driver brought me along Atlantic. It was a horrible way to come into New York. It was dirty and graffiti and traffic. And all the way back from the airport, I was thinking, why do I live in New York after <laughs> being, and I feel like this when I come back from New Zealand too. And then I'm in New York for like about a day and then I'm like, I love New York. It's an adventure. I enjoy, I live in a high rise on the 47th floor. It's just a studio apartment, but I look out on a sea of lights and then I can see the weather. I've got like floor to ceiling windows. And you know, I, and the, you see people. The thing I noticed about, uh, different about California to uh, New York was in California, I got in my car and drove everywhere. I never saw people. In New York, you walk around and you see people all the time. And I like that interaction. So there's something to be said for both of them. Well, okay. Well, thank you for sharing about that. It's like uh, going from suburbs to Toronto downtown. When yeah. I get yeah. to teach in downtown, I'm like suddenly, oh, well, there are people around. Right. Because <laughs> here it's all true. you see is traffic up up, uh, uh, up where we are. Um, anyways, uh, Wendy, um you like San Diego, you like uh, New York, but you chose uh, Las Vegas for a competition that you're organizing um, in December, Holiday Dance Classic Championship. Why Las Vegas? Well, actually, when I, I've been with that comp over 25 years, and it was in Arizona. So I, I bought into the competition because Chris Morris, who bless his heart, has since passed away. He wanted to dance with me. And he was like, why don't you uh, come into this competition with me and another couple? And they had already run it for maybe two years. So it was in Las Vegas in Scottsdale and one of those big resorts. And the competition was filled with, uh, the, the hotel was filled with poinsettia plants. It was around Christmas. It's close to Christmas time. 
And anyway, my business partners said, you know, we've been thinking of moving this to Las Vegas. And at that time, there were no competitions in Las Vegas. And we were so worried about moving it to Las Vegas. But anyway, we moved it to the Monte Carlo Hotel. That was the first hotel we had. Well, we outgrew the Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo that first year. The competition grew. We went to Treasure Island. We outgrew Treasure Island. Then we went to Caesar's Palace. But Caesar's Palace is really too big for a competition. It's too far to walk from the uh, hotel rooms to the ballroom. Then we moved for the first two years the Venetian was open. Again, that was a great hotel, but too far to walk from the uh, hotel rooms to the ballroom. Then we went to the Luxor. We were there for quite a few years. We tried Paris one year, back to the Luxor, and then we went to the Tropicana because they completely renovated that hotel. And uh, But they were quite difficult to work with at the Tropicana. And then the Luxor wooed us back again, and they really were the easiest hotel for us to work with. They were very accommodating. So we went back to the Luxor, and that's where we are now. What kind of uh, things can people find at the holiday dance classic championships? Well, first of all, it's a Christmas comp. So the ballroom is filled with Christmas trees and poinsettias. It's a sea of red poinsettias. Because I never forgot that first time I saw it in Arizona. And so I always stayed true to those Christmas flowers. Um, we have a day where it's Christmas sweaters. So we all wear sweaters. All the judges wear Christmas sweaters. And if they didn't bring them, I bought some for them to get into. Uh, we always had a show on the Sunday night. Our shows were legendary at uh, Holiday Dance Classic. Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, the NDCA in their infinite wisdom decided to not allow couples to dance in our shows, not even if you were teaching pro-am, which was very, very disappointing because I had actually had those shows with everybody being in them. Anybody who wanted to be in them got paid exactly the same. If you were in the back row of the chorus or you're the champion, you got the same money. So, But it gave the chance for people who wouldn't get shows to actually dance in shows. So now they won't allow, allow us to do it. I was like, okay, so what am I going to do now? I've still got to do a show. So now I make all my judges dance. So any right. judge who comes to a holiday to <laughs> classic has to bring their dance shoes and participate in some manner. Do you choreograph those dances? Um, you know what I do is, um, like the Australians, I chose, uh, I still call Australia home or Waltzing Matilda, and I make them, uh, I put the Australians together. And then I, I had the New Zealand judges that were two last year. So the haka is a very famous dance that the All Blacks do before their rugby games. So I put the haka on the big black back screen and then I told my two New Zealanders, you need to do a dance and make it part haka. So they did. They did a dance called La Bomba and then went into a haka. So that tied it in with what was going on on the back screen. And then the three guys from England, there were three English judges, I made them dance to They'll Always Be in England. So I try to, um, it's always comedy. You know, I have a few serious numbers like Hannah Carton and Dance yeah. with Victor, Eugene Dance with Maria, Marat Dance with Alina. And then the rest of it, I really sort of make comedy and make fun. And the judges, uh, the judges have fun actually, and the audience loves it. So that just shows the variety of world-class judges at your competition, right? Well, this year, somebody was just asking me about my judges. It's not being confirmed, but I have a judge from Finland, Germany, one from New Zealand, uh, two from Australia, and all over the United States and Canada. A very international. It wow. is. I world have the judges. most most international panel out of any comp in America. Yeah, it's amazing. That's, That's amazing. So let let remind uh, let let's remind the dates of your competition yes. to our uh, listeners. So this competition is going to be from December 11th through the 15th in Las Vegas at the beautiful Luxor Hotel. And I have one other thing I always have been known for. On the last night after the show, we have the best party out of anyone. We have it in the club. We have food. We have a DJ. Everybody dances with everybody. It's it's like a great ending to the um, competition. So if someone wants to join into this competition, where would they find information? Uh, can you name the website address, please, Wendy? Yeah, it's called HolidayDanceClassic.com. And you can go on there and you can see the schedule and the events. And if you have any questions, you can uh, write to us and we'll try and answer them. It's awesome. amazing. That's a good thing for our listeners. It's a good thing for our listeners to know. Yeah, there's just w one thing. If you're going to be a spectator, uh, try to order your tickets prior to the event. One of the problems we've incurred in Las Vegas Big is the demand. unions. Um, yeah, the unions interfere with a lot of our comp. We can't even have video anymore at our 
competition because of the unions. So um, spectator tickets really need to be uh, purchased in advance. So it's just a thing you see with your eyes now. Huh? <laughs> just a thing you watch yeah, now. Something, yeah. yeah, something for, for a change to memorize and keep the memory there. It's like going to a concert <laughs> and, and not allowing to film it, right? So you have I to know. go there and you, watch well, it. You can, film your, you can film it now. People with their iPhones or phones, or they can film the competition. It was just that we had a videographer and the, uh, the unions decided he was commercial TV. And even though we said to him, no, he's not commercial TV, he's just videoing people. Uh, for competitors. At the competitions, yeah. He did have a pl place where he was interviewing people, and then he would just put it up on our websites and things. Well, they wouldn't have it. it and it would be, it was something like $30,000 for me to have people following the video people, and that was just cost prohibitive. So, the good, th I don't know if it's good or bad for you, but you can film your own dancing or have your friends film it or whatever. I We're going to for sure have some videos on our Facebook page of Holiday Classic. Yes. Um, some professional and some showcases. of the Wendy's cho choreographies that are oh, yeah. known for sure so maybe we'll go back to dancing with the stars maybe we'll show some of that choreography well you if you look on my website wendyjohnsondance.com which is a terrible website because it hasn't been updated in about 15 years but on there are some uh some of the numbers that i did for dancing with the stars with the professionals one to santana uh I, i'm not sure if the one i did the dick clark tribute to I'm not sure if that's on there, but well, we'll make sure that we share those videos on our podcast and then our listeners can follow us uh, through different platforms. Sam would name those platforms once again for everyone. So we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, and also Podbean. You can follow our social media on Facebook and Instagram. Our username is at Grand Circle Podcast. And once again, uh, we had in our studio today as a guest, famous and the one and only Wendy Johnson. Thank you so much for coming, Wendy. We'd like to thank you for being here uh, with us. Uh, thank you for such insightful interview. It's been wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you so much. It was fun. Just thank to you. remind everyone that uh, our sponsor for this episode is Holiday Dance Classic Championships, which is taking place on December 11th through 15th in Las Vegas at the beautiful Luxor Hotel. You can visit their website at holidaydanceclassic.com. Thank you, everyone. And until next time, bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.